All right, all right, all right. Welcome, everybody. Another episode of Office Hours. Rock and rolling here. Uh, Ronald from Brazil. Welcome. Good to see you. Kosha, love your content. Appreciate it, man. Thank you. I see your question. We will get to that shortly. Uh, Jay Straczynski, we've begun. And off we go. Uh, all right. So uh, we're going to kind of kind of keep wetting you all load up in here. Um, and oh, here's our good friend, Wild Catapalo. Welcome again. Uh, as we all kind of get loaded in here, uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, learning more efficiently. Um, and I've got a special guest who's going to be helping me dive deep into this topic. Um, at the end of the day, uh, learning is at the heart of performance. And if you want to perform better, right, learning is effectively the mechanism uh, that's going to help you to do that. So we can talk about that from a mental side, of course, uh, and from the technical side as well. Um, and so if there are any flaws uh, in your approach to learning, it means you're just going to slow, your learning is going to slow down. Uh, your performance is going to have more ups and downs, and you're going to have a lot more uh, emotional instability. Uh, and so to help us make some progress here today, uh, I'm going to be joined uh, by Richard Mogan. Now, Richard and I uh, work together on my trading psychology masterclass, uh, which we're having a big sale on, and I'll you know give you some more on that in a moment. Uh, now, Richard is the director of education at Trader Lion, which aims to teach members how to effectively trade growth stocks. He shares a huge amount of free education on his YouTube channel, uh, which I've just posted in the chat here. Uh, and, uh, you know, he's got a, a decent number of subscribers, uh, maybe, I don't know, 15x mine. But that's not, I'm not jealous. I'm, I'm aspirational. Uh, Richard's a great guy, and I'm, I'm uh, really grateful to have him, uh, have him on today. And he's, he's also agreed to spend the entire hour with us, which is, which is special. Uh, now, I've got some questions, so I'm going to kind of occupy his brain for a little bit, um, you know, as we talk about learning and try to really unpack this and just kind of have a good conversation. Uh, but feel free uh, to post uh, questions for him in the chat uh, as we get rolling here. Um, I think what we're going to do is try to answer some questions from both sides, at least the trading stuff. I know there's some poker questions. Uh, maybe we'll test Richard and see how his, uh, his poker chops are. But a uh, bunch of other people in here. Mike, welcome. Michael, welcome. Smiley, rumpled one. Y'all are uh, showing up in, in droves as, as usual. Um, and as Paul said, the great Richard Moglin. So let's bring him on. Richard. Good to see you, man. Thanks for coming on today. This is great. Yeah, of course, Jared. Thank you so much for having me on. And I got to say, my my poker skills are non-existent. So uh, if you want to teach me a thing or two, I'd be happy to learn that. Uh, but yeah, it's a pleasure to be on. It, it's always great chatting with you. And um, I've learned so much, you know, over the past year when we've been working together. So yeah, looking forward to this. Thanks, man. Yeah, it's been it's been a lot of fun. And I can tell you that, um, you know, my friends don't believe me, but I'm just not that good of a poker player. So I don't think you want to be learning poker from me, but I, I have... I have a couple of people, you know, if you ever want to, uh, you know, get, get, uh, you know, get some chops there in the world series or, or wherever else. Uh, you got the connects. Yeah. I got, yeah, I got some people I can, I can hook up with. So <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. So this is, I mean, like we, we talk about like learning and, you know, we obviously talked about it in the trading psychology masterclass. It was a kind of an important feature of that, that program. I mean, like you've been a new trader yourself. You've been educating new traders. You've been around, Lots of great traders. Um, and I guess first question for me, like when it, when it comes to learning to become a great trader or just become a, a skilled trader, um, what have you found to be kind of the big pain points that uh, that really kind of slow up that learning process? Yeah, that's a good question. And, and just uh, very quickly before we get in, just to give some context, um, yeah. I started trading in, in 2018. Uh, I took a class at the University of Maryland taught by uh, a trader, Dr. Eric Wish, who's been doing it part time for 50 years, uh, trading gross, basically gross stocks, uh, very similar to my style currently. Um, so I, I'm relatively new, but I, I think I've done some things to really accelerate my learning curve. And, and we'll talk about those a little bit later on. Um, and now, of course, I've kind of taken out the mantle to, to help you know, newer traders uh, develop their skills as well over at Line. In terms of the biggest pain points, I, I think uh, one of the biggest things that newer traders struggle with is randomness. Uh, there's so many different styles. There's so many different sources of information out there. There's day trading, there's swing trading, there's position trading, there's investing. And a lot of people flip from one thing to the next as as this stops working. Oh, I made a good trade like this. Uh, you know, I'll try it again. 
oh, I see this person post this on, on Twitter. I'll try out that. That might work, might not. Um, so there's no kind of specialization. It, everything is very random. Their entries are random. Their exits are, exits are random. And until you really pick a style and pick a process and kind of focus on that, it's hard to work to improve your skills because you're not sure if what the market is telling you is feedback or you're just trying something new and you know it didn't work that time. Uh, so that randomness, I think, is a big problem with people. And I would definitely say, you know, pick one thing, pick swing trading, master that, pick one setup, master that. Then after you've kind of gotten really familiar with that, then you can move on to the next thing. So I think that randomness is uh, a really big deal. And what goes with that is having an undefined process. Um, I think a lot of traders go into the arena not having a rule set written out, which is basically not having a contract with themselves about these are the rules I'm going to follow. And that's going to bite them, you know, in the rear end eventually. You can swear um, here. It's, it's yeah. like not, not, a, not a family friendly environment. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah. Yeah. Not having that rule set. I mean, it, it's amazing. I mean, money is on the line. Thousands of dollars are on the, my, on the line. People trade their retirements. Uh, but they don't have a rule set written down where they really thought things through. If this, then that, this is how I'm going to respond. Uh, so that lack of preparation, I think is a, a big, big thing. And, you know, that lack of preparation can cause all sorts of problems, both technical and mental game, as I'm sure you know. Um, and then at the very end of this, the, the last thing I want to talk about is uh, even after they're making trades, a lot of these traders aren't looking back at what they did, what they actually did execution wise. They're not doing post analysis, both from a technical standpoint, as well as a mental game preparedness routine wise. Um, so there's, they're, they're kind of lacking that feedback loop, if that makes sense, where they do an action, it might work, it might not work, but they don't learn anything from it. I always say like, even if you take a loss, you can learn something from it. And one of the big, biggest things that I learned in that class from Dr. Eric Wish is he made us through a simulation where we did trading for three months. Uh, he basically had us analyze every single trade we did and determine, you know, take take a look at our biggest losers or biggest winners. What did we do wrong with the biggest losers? What did we do right with the biggest winners? And, you know, try to try to find those common threads. And just as you've said a few times, uh, you know, in the masterclass and, and, and on Twitter and your book, just try to suck a little bit less. Try to do what you're doing wrong a little bit less and try to do what you're, you're doing right a little bit more. And, you know, eventually that can only lead you to a path to improvement, which is all, you know, what efficient learning is really about. So if you're lacking that feedback loop, it's really hard to be efficient with your learning because at the end of the day, whatever, you, whatever action you take and whatever the result is, you're not gaining something from it. So I think those are some definite pain points and, and problems that I see a lot of uh, traders who I talk with and have interviewed uh, in their early years. Um, yeah, I think that's a lot that they go through. Yeah, and I, and I would I would say very clearly that uh, the poker players out there have certainly benefited from what you're saying because obviously there is such a par parallel between those two, uh, and so right. like the randomness in poker and the uh, the you know there's a lot of different styles of, of playing the game right and and maybe less so in terms of the variety than it is in trading but yeah randomness is a massive factor um, you know I think the idea of having structure and creating feedback loops is is a is a critical one. Uh, you know, here's somebody saying that, uh, you know, maybe you should do a deep dive on soccer uh, rather than football. But, you <laughs> I'd know, definitely but, be more qualified for that. Yeah. For sure, for sure. yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I think that the point holds, right, that within soccer, right, the feedback loops are so much more accurate unless you have just like a crazy coach or a crazy ref. But even then, the feedback loops could be fine if you're kind of aware enough to know uh, that, that that is the case, right? But in poker and in trading, early on, it is so difficult. So I think you've given some great advice in terms of how to create, I don't want to say anchors, because I, I think that has a connotation, but just like some guideposts to kind of navigate the short term in a way that is definitely going to feel limiting. Like it should not feel like you can just kind of go out and do whatever you want, because that's right. you just like kind of flailing like a like a baby learning to walk versus actually learning a system and we're kind of operating in a system and a structure that can that can move you forward. Um, I mean, maybe you kind of answered a few of these, you know, kind of points here already, but like in terms of the traders that you've seen kind of take that next step and kind of gone from, you know, the aspiring to the actual, you know, right. kind of skilled and competent, like, are there any kind of X factors or kind of key that you think that you've seen with regards to like, what has helped them to kind of get over the hump? Like, were they able to navigate that early phase better or more efficiently? Were they, you know, more pragmatic? Were they kind of just 
where there's certain mentalities, right? They kind of willing to do whatever it takes. I mean, I'll stop, you know, prompting you and let you <laughs> let you talk. Yeah, def definitely. The last thing you said, because I think um, attitude is is immense, right? If you really want to get good at trading, you're going to figure it out. Um, and it's interesting. A lot of the, the traders I've talked to. So I, I do a lot for, for people who don't know. I do a lot of interviews with U.S. investing championships, hedge fund managers, those type of people. And a lot of them, it's interesting enough, have some type of sports background. And I think that translates really well uh, because, you know, we're used to failure all the time. You know, soccer is kind of my thing. I play baseball as well. Um, Oliver Kell, who is the U.S. investing champion of 2020, uh, he he played football. Um, so I think sports teaches us a lot about, you know, it's OK to fail. It's all about the process. It's about, you know, putting in that preparation for uh, that event. So you're you're able to perform at your best even though that might not be, um, you know, enough to win. Um, so that, that, that mentality of it's about, you know, just putting in the work, doing, focusing on process over performance. I think that's key. Um, focusing on sucking less. I already talked about that. Um, I'd also say the traders that I've interviewed, it, it's, it's interesting. A lot of them have found a community of like-minded traders. A lot of these people are on Twitter and that kind of support system, I think helps a lot. Uh, because, you know, trading can be a very isolating game. I, I don't know how people did it like 40 years ago when, uh, you know, there, there wasn't Twitter back then. Um, but, you know, having those people to not only bounce ideas off of, but also support each other when, you know, you, you're you're having a bad month and you're, you're taking a lot of losses over and over again, that person to kind of steer you back in the right direction, remember, uh, tell you to remember, you know, the good times, remember, focus on your process, focus on your routines, all that. I think that's incredibly helpful. Um, and a really another key thing that uh, the successful traders who have gotten over that hump share is their processes are extremely simple. Um, I see a lot of newer traders on Twitter. If you look at their charts, they've got the MACD, they've got the stochastic, they've got this indicator, they got this one, and it's such it's it it's so much noise. Uh, so if you if you really want to kind of follow in the footsteps of the, these great traders, you want to focus on what's really actionable and simple and very repeatable. Um, so keep your charts very clean. If you look at my charts back in uh, 2018 when I first started versus now, I've gotten rid of a lot of indicators and I'm mostly focusing on price and volume at this moment and a few moving averages as gods. Uh, so that's something that I've really worked on actively to, to simplify my process and make sure that everything on my screen has a rule associated with it. It's actionable and it's very clear cut. Um, so try to keep it simple. And that also goes with uh, the type of setups you're trading. If you've got you know, 15 different indicators like the MACD stochastic, they, they might, you know, be kind of saying the same thing in terms of their, they're all momentum based indicators. But if you're trying to combine 15 different indicators and combine those signals into something actionable, it's a lot harder than if you just stick with one and then really study that, go back in time, look at a bunch of different examples um, and really excel at that particular setup, focus on one setup, master it. And then once you finally do that, move on to the next. So um, yeah, that's kind of a long winded answer, but I, I think I touched on some important stuff there. Keep it simple is kind of the biggest thing and just, just focus on mastering one style, one setup, and then you can expand, introduce a little bit more tools if you want to get a little bit fancier. Yeah. And we're, we're talking efficiency here, right? So, yeah. so there is a lot of efficiency gained from taking that advice, right? With that, that, you know, if we're going to focus in this from an, like an inchworm standpoint and, you know, a progression, right? If you try to take on too much, the front end of your inchworm can certainly expand and right. Your A game can get better theoretically, but like it means that that's going to happen less and less frequently, which means that your C game is going to kind of trail behind and it's just going to lead to a lot of inconsistency because it takes so much effort and energy to focus on, you know, a lot at once, you know, and at the same time, I, I think there's a, there's a, a clear differentiation. We're talking about, you know, kind of more experienced traders able to kind of go through this arc where it will get more complicated early on. Right. And there is, I think a mistake that can be made when you try to make things too simple, too quickly, right. You want to make it complicated enough so that you can learn a lot and be robust in your learning. Yeah. But then, you know, at a certain point you want to be, I, I think it's smart, right. Make things more simple. And that simplicity, you know, should add to a lot of kind of mental clarity, which, then can give you the ability to make, you know, intuitive decisions and, you know, kind of make some, uh, you know, high level decisions you wouldn't, you know, normally be able to. 
Yeah, so, you, you want to test things. And if I could just add one thing, yeah, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, Jared. Yeah, what you said about, you know, the interim concept, I think that's that's so, so important because so many people focus on, you know, the setups, the perfect entry point, the perfect combination of indicators, you know, finding the optimal thing, which is kind of their A game, when if they really focused on kind of the back end, the C game, which is proper risk management, position sizing, making sure every time they enter a position, they enter a stop loss, it's at a logical spot. Uh, it's actually a good entry point that's following their rules. You know, just doing those basic things, the fundamentals, that goes an extremely long way to raising that baseline of performance. Um, going back to kind of sports analogy, uh, back in high school, I, I, I played baseball and my JV coach, one of his focuses was on minimizing the number of free bases that our team gives up. So a free base could be uh, a walk, an error, uh, a stolen base that we allow the other team to get. So basically little mistakes that benefit the other team. And yeah. there was some study that he had found where if you give up, I forget the actual number, but if you give up less than 14 free bases, I'm just kind of making up that number, you're much more likely to win that ball game just because, you know, just that little bit of difference can go a long way, especially in high school when there's there's a lot more randomness, a lot more mistakes going on. Um, just focusing on that and focus on sucking less as a team, and this translates obviously easily to the stock market, um, it's going to raise that baseline, as I said. So I think, yeah, it's so, so important to focus on the C game. And I, I, I really enjoy that part of your book and and uh, and the part of the masterclass where you talked about that as well. So I think that's really important. Yeah, no, that's great. I mean, I think like the the efficiency gained right from continuing to kind of hammer away at C game is is not to be underestimated. Um, right. You know, I wrote a, a blog uh, this month, and that's kind of the theme here. Um, I'll drop the uh, the link here uh, in the chat and just kind of quickly uh, share it with everybody. Uh, this is the uh, the blog here, um, learning more efficiently. Um, now, the the reason I bring this up is because um, there's uh, some uh, there's a theory in here that I write about uh, called uh, the adult learning model, right? These sort of four stages of, of competency um, that traders go through, that poker players go through when you're learning anything, really. Um, and it's and it's adult learning model because, you know, kids don't have the same kind of conscious attention that we do uh, when we're younger. And so this adult learning model is, is really important. It kind of gives you <clears throat> a bit of a framework to understand the stages that you're going to go through. And you know, I didn't talk about this in the trading book. I talk about it in the poker book. Uh, I didn't want to throw so many concepts. So it's it's here. But the basic premise, right, is that you need to be working towards this fourth stage, right, where you become unconsciously competent, right? You get so good at something, right, that you no longer need to think about it. And, and you know, I think your point about, you know, making sure that your C game is really strong and the ways that you can do that from a technical standpoint is is really important because if you repeat a bad habit, right? Make a mistake there. You have gotten better at it, right? Like learning is never neutral. So if you're going to be more efficient at learning, you, you know, maybe the, the asterisks on the, the title of this blog should have been like learning the stuff that you want to learn, right? <laughs> we don't want you to be really efficient at repeating your bad habits, repeating those, those mistakes. And so when you identify something that is weak in your unconscious competence, right? You know, let's say it's uh, mistimed entries, or you know, folding hands pre uh, raising hands pre flop that you shouldn't. Right? We could classify those mistakes as being habits. Right? You're actually very good at those things, and so unconscious competence does not mean that this is the stuff that you want to be great at. It means that you've trained it to such a deep level, right? And so when uh, we're trying to upgrade that process, right, you have to add a lot of conscious attention to it, uh, and, and I think the more you can simplify what it is that you're focusing on, the more likely you are uh, to be able to suck less um, in those key moments. Yeah. Uh, so in terms of like maturation as a trader, um, mm -hmm. you know, you kind of mentioned this like kind of desire for traders who are, you know, constantly looking to improve, but maybe in the wrong way because they're a bit more kind of sporadic and random, even in their approach. And, and I would argue that there's probably some, weaknesses and confidence in there. There's probably some fear in there that's, you know, kind of forcing their hand in a sense to be a bit more scattered. But, you know, from a technical side or from a, a, an educational side on your perspective, right? I mean, what what things do you see in terms of like how people are able, our traders are able to kind of find their fingerprint, get more settled, you know, into a, a strategy and, and, and not feel like they need to kind of keep experimenting to, to, to figure out what that is? 
Yeah, that's that's a good question. Uh, I would say it kind of comes back to what I've been saying about um, picking one style, one setup, and focus on studying that as much as possible and specializing in that before you move on to the next thing. Uh, just one setup in the markets can be enough to you know do extremely well in every market cycle. Uh, now, there's a few kind of different setups that probably people familiar with kind of the William O'Neill style of trading, which is growth style trading, are familiar with. There's breakouts, there's pullback buys, there's earnings gap uh, setups. Um, but just focusing on one and finding 100 examples, 200 examples, 500 examples in the past and looking really those through uh, through a magnifying lens and seeing uh, thinking about how would you have traded that? Uh, how would you have reacted as it you know broke below where you thought it was going to go? Where would you have placed your stop loss? Uh, how would you have managed risk? How would you have sized the position? Um, going back and, and studying, doing a deep dive on that particular setup um, and taking screenshots and, and, and creating basically a model book that you can refer back to uh, when, when you're kind of lacking that confidence. I think that specialization and that training uh, can go a long way because once once you've really studied something, then going forward, you've got more confidence, you're you're more disciplined. Uh, you know that maybe even though it might not work this time, over time, this setup has been successful in the past. If I do X, Y, Z, um, if it doesn't work, maybe it's just the market environment. Um, you know, I think that's really important. And I would I'd also say, you know, if it's not working, think about what's what's different about the market environment a little bit. Um, you don't want to switch up your style too much, but maybe you do have to adapt. You know, this year it's been a, a bear market; it's been very volatile. A lot of the best traders I know have kind of sh shortened their time frame and are you know dynamic enough to do that. But maybe that's something reserved for someone who who's been doing it for ten years and they have that confidence that they're able to do that versus someone who's you know in year one through three where you just want to focus on being consistent in your process and. Uh, then you're just kind of sitting out and waiting for your pitch once again, what's a new bar, ball market resume. So I'm not sure if I actually answered your question there, but uh, th those are a few thoughts that I, I have on that subject. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think it was it was interesting to hear you say like to what I took was like do that back testing, yep. not with like rose colored glasses, not from like an idealistic standpoint, but really trying to put yourself into these key moments and understanding almost like a test like if you were taking a test from that moment you don't get to see what the future looks like you know what would you have done and how would you have felt in that whole process and i mean it's it is tough to do to really put yourself back in that spot but i think if you come at this process with you know a real kind of dedication to the craft right you're not just yes. here to make money quickly right you're you're here to become a trader and if you're a poker player it's the same thing you're trying to become a skilled player not somebody that just can you know Maybe get lucky, make a couple quick bucks, and 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 that's it. Um, so yeah, I think it's it's important. And you know, here's Jake saying like I should have paper traded for a while until I got my tra uh, trading plan and routine in place would have saved me a lot, right? And the confidence came when I had a plan and only cared about my process. I mean that, right. yeah. So again, when we're talking about efficiency, I'm sure Jake, like many others, like kind of knew that they should have done this, and yet um, it's easy to kind of want to shortcut the process. So to me, we're kind of, kind of going back to that you know, initial question of like, what are some of the big, you know, hangups? I, I think generally there's going to be a, a degree of impatience to kind of like want to make money quickly. You know, I go back to a, a great quote that I, I love from a, a blog that I wrote. I didn't, I, sorry, not my, not my quote. I mean, it was posted in a, in a blog. Um, you know, Abraham Lincoln said, right, if you uh, give me six hours to top, chop down a tree, I'm going to spend the first four hours sharpening the ax. Right. You know, and it's so hard to want to kind of have that, that like, level of discipline needed to prime yourself to do it well, right? Another analogy would be, you know, uh, rockets. I don't know what it is today, but I think back when I was a kid, you know, the Challenger, I think used like 50% of its fuel to go like 50 meters, 50 yards, right? It's an insane, right? That, that initial thrust to drive yourself forward requires so much energy and it's so easy to want the results to happen sooner. But if you get the results sooner, you know, maybe like what Jake is saying, you're you're not really kind of prepared for those emotional ups and downs. You haven't built the foundation. You don't have that unconscious competence that's going to allow you to, you know, thrive at that point. You're going to continue to go through ups and downs. Um, so, yeah, it's a great stuff, Richard. And and I guess, again, we're going to get to your questions. Um, I have one more question, which is, um, you know, kind of as we kind of um, 
maybe shift gears more of the psychological side uh, of mm -hmm. things. Uh, I mean, obviously, right. I know, you know, the value of, of psychology is why you asked me to do the masterclass. Um, but I'm, I'm curious kind of how you either for yourself or how you look at a, how you kind of prioritize like kind of both sides of it. Right. I mean, obviously you've got to learn the technicals, right. You and I both agree. Trading is not hundred percent psychological. It's also not hundred percent technical. So how do you kind of play the game of, you know, kind of balancing prior to prioritizing both sides of it? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, both sides are important. Um, like you said, in, in those first, you know, in your first year, especially, there's so much to learn on the technical side of things that, you know, focusing on your trading psychology might not be the most beneficial part of it. Uh, you might want to work on it a little bit. But, you know, learning to read a chart, learning what an indicator is, learning the uh, the mechanics of entering a trade. Uh, there's so much to learn right there. But I would say once you've learned those base things and you're able to look at a chart and make a decision, uh, a lot of it comes down to discipline, uh, preparedness, um, execution of the actual system. And that that's that's very mental. And going back to the sports things, I mean, you can know how to swing a bat and you can do it fine off the tee in practice, but it's a di it's a different thing hitting off a pitcher alive, you know, Um so you got to be prepared with the challenges that come um, come with that. And kind of going back to what what that person said, I think that was Jake about paper trading. I so in that initial class that I took, I was it was a paper trading. It was it was a live thing, but it was paper trading. And once I started my my real money account, the first account that I made, uh, I found it completely different. There are a whole much more emotions going on because it was just a different thing. It, it was, it was real money, even though it wasn't huge, uh, but it changed the dynamic of it. So I think honestly, starting with real money um, enough that, you know, a loss feels like something, but obviously not enough that it's going to ruin you financially. Definitely start small. Um, I think that makes a big deal because you're immediately aware of those added emotions that come with losing real dollars. Um, and that's what's going to be like real life from then on out. So uh, and I, I think that scales. I think learning how, you know, losing $1 versus losing $10 versus losing $100 on a stop loss, it kind of feels the same. So I, I, I would advise against paper trading is kind of uh, what I would go. But I want to hear your thoughts on that too, Jared, because uh, you might have your own there. Uh, but getting back to the mental game versus the technical, once you've mastered those technical skills, I think it's really important to work on journaling, work on your maps. Um, I'm actually going to go back through the entire masterclass uh, and instead of acting as the host, as I was, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go out, go there and really fulfill, you know, complete the maps, make sure I've got those up to up to par, um, do mental hand histories, all of that, uh, because I think it's a really valuable process and, um, you know, serves you well, because a lot of the experienced traders who I've talked to, uh, the problems that they're dealing with now are in the mental side of things. That's where they mm -hmm. feel like their bottleneck is. Uh, so that's kind of why I think it's so important. And I, I think that whatever style you are, if you're an investor or a day trader, you're going to be experiencing emotions that impact your decision making. So uh, you should you, you need a you need a mental game system to address those, uh, just like you need a technical system to actually address the mechanics of trading. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's right. So you're going to become the the, uh, the student, which is which is very cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess quickly to the paper trading piece. For me, I think it's, it's all about like kind of the mentality you have about paper trading, right? You, you've mm -hmm. got to bring the sense of kind of urgency and diligence to it like it's live you have to force yourself to treat it that way and it's never going to become equal but if you can get it 50 percent of the way there I, I think you'll create enough of a reaction that you can begin to kind of map for some traders right? i mean i had a new inquiry for a client who i mean it's like losing any like just being in the live market is completely paralyzing which means there's a huge opportunity to to, to make paper trading really viable if they can make that you know, kind of more realistic. Um, I do have one kind of quick follow-up question because, and sure. I know uh, I want to get to everybody else's questions here, um, but like, I, I don't often kind of get a chance to ask somebody this question because most of the time I'm asking questions is with a client, I mean, you know, they're paying me. I don't want to be, you know, kind of too, uh, too monopolizing of, of uh, their time for my purposes. Yeah. Uh, but like the, you know, you mentioned how, you know, when you got into the live market and, you know, the feeling of it being real, I mean, could you describe, I mean, maybe it's, it's different now or hard to remember, but like the actual kind of change in your brain that it would occur, like the change in your perception, like, like you're, you're looking at the chart in the exact same way. And it's like, to me, I think your vision actually changes, like the things that you actually see and what you pay attention to changes. 
mm-hmm. your acuity, like your actual ability to see, I think can oftentimes change. And, and then of course, the actual things that you're thinking about, right, start to become like warped and altered. I don't know. Can you talk about that a little bit and kind of what, what you recognize for yourself in that in that early stage? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I got to do a mental hand history on that looking back. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, like when I first opened that account, uh, what I remember is, you know, I was following my process. I'd set up my entries ahead of time, alerts, all of that. Uh, but when it actually came to placing the trade, everything felt faster to me. It, it felt it felt more real, if that makes sense. Like uh, as it was pushing up through the pivot and I'm in it, I bought my shares. Everything's going well. Uh, you feel this excitement creeping in. And and then when it reverses, then it it, fe- it feels it feels like a, you know, a, a punch to punch the head or punch uh, to your body. You know, you, you really feel it. So. Um, yeah, I would say, and, and kind of as, as I've traded it a lot more and, and gotten more, um, experienced, like, um, I don't feel as intense those emotions. I, I don't know if that's just repetition or getting used to it. Um, but definitely initially it felt very, it felt very fast and, and kind of going back to baseball. I've done that a few times. Sorry. Uh, when, when you're seeing the pitch, well, uh, you know, things slow down and you're able to wait and 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 wait for your pitch uh you know outside corner if you like that to drive it the other way but when when you're kind of when you just move up from jv to varsity and people are pitching 10 miles an hour faster you're you're kind of a little bit behind the curve so you're kind of forcing everything uh and that's when you get nervous that's when your mechanics kind of break down a little bit and you know your swing might suffer um so you just got to get used to that next level um so yeah that i think that's a little bit of kind of what i was feeling uh any any kind of follow-up on those on, on yeah, that, no, uh, and, sure. I think, well, and that's what I was asking because to me, yeah. I think right, it doesn't matter what we're talking about: baseball, yeah. soccer, trading, poker, right. golf. Like, there is that, sh- that shift that occurs when, when you know, your emotions get ramped up, you feel overwhelmed, you know, uh, you feel kind of behind the curve, which is a nice pun. Um, and you know, I, I think at the end of the day, right, that's ultimately kind of why we created the masterclass. Right. You know, and so uh, let's say we're going to kind of insert, um, you know, promotional moment here. Um, right. So, look, we're having a sale two hundred dollars off. The price is going to rise next year. So, I mean, if at any point in your trading career, right, whether you're a newer trader, you know, at the point that Richard just says, right, not new enough where you need technical knowledge, which, you know, if you're uh, looking at, uh, you know, momentum growth stock type trading, you know, trader line um, and maybe others, Richard could say. Uh, Trader Line offers courses, you know, kind of along those lines, both from Oliver, Oliver Cowell and uh, Stan Weinstein. Uh, but, you know, if you kind of graduated past that point, right, in psychology, emotions, you know, kind of being able to get that stuff cleared out. I agree with Richard, right, that to some degree it is about kind of conditioning yourself to that environment. But then, you know, if your execution is lagging, if you're remaining kind of too emotionally compromised, right, I mean, this this master class is really, um, you know, very, very robust. Uh, actually, you can see all the... Uh, uh, the, uh, the modules, yeah. all the modules here uh, from from TraderLine. And so then this is the the course content, right? This is what the masterclass is all about. And what's nice is that we've gone through, uh, you can see originally we recorded these as five webinars, um, you know, and, and now have kind of reformulated this so that it's much more of a course like independent study driven. Uh, and, you know, for me, when I look at like, all right, how does this relate to the book? It, it really kind of brings to life a lot of uh, the tools that I, I use, uh, try to make things a bit more simple to kind of walk you through the process of developing uh, a strategy and a system for yourself. Uh, ton of questions, ton of examples were reviewed, you know, lots of mental hand histories, uh, lots of, uh, of maps and profiles uh, developed. And there's a couple of new proprietary tools that are in here as well. Um, I wouldn't necessarily call that like a deal breaker, but I think if you are on the fence about you know, kind of wanting to be kind of guided through the process about how to uh, actually develop a system for yourself, right? I mean, this is uh, as robust as it gets. And I think, you know, my goal with it was to make it the best trading psychology system that's out of of the market. Now, maybe there are other trading psychology systems that do different things than what I offer. If you know my material, you know, and want to take it to the next level, I think this is, um, you know, your, your natural next step. Um, so yeah, I don't know, Richard, you, you, you're about to become a student in this thing. Um, <laughs> what, I guess, what are, you, what are you most looking forward to as you, uh, as, as you're about to kind of dig through this again? 
Yeah, I'm about to take it for the second time. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to the new layout and you know taking it step by step. And I, I think another issue that a lot of traders experience is the technical system that they learn. A lot of those systems solution for dealing with emotions is to just ignore them and try to you know shut them down, be robotic. And a big mindset switch talking to you, reading your book and, and doing the masterclass is that it can be an edge to listen to your emotions and once once you've kind of cleared out everything and you're able to you know interpret them in a very pure way they can really add to your performance and add to your intuition about what's going on so um yeah i'm looking forward to to working through everything and so i can get to that level and and just kind of unlock that next skill um and just to add about the improvements that we've made to the course we've added content from your book which i think is fantastic right. um and we, we've really made the clips uh, of the longer webinars uh we've really created those in a way that um, everything flows very naturally. And I think it's a great progression for people. Um, and, you know, like I said, if you're an investor, position trader, swing trader, day trader, um, I think this course complements any system that you, that you can know right now. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just looking forward to it. I, I'm sure I'll have some feedback, maybe make some tweaks and make it even better. Um, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I'm looking forward to it. That's awesome. Yeah. And I think, uh, Dars makes a good point here, right? It, it, it works if you commit to it, right. Then right. it's worth it. Uh, you know, like anything, if you don't, then you're, uh, you're behind the eight ball. So, um, all right. Link for the masterclass in the, uh, is in the chat. Um, I'll say really quickly, um, big sale on my books through the end of the month. So again, trader line course, $200 off till the end of November, 35% off my books. Um, and so, all right, promotional moment over. Let's get to your questions. I know there's a bunch of them here. Um, uh, and I know some even came uh, early on. So, uh, Kosha, you mentioned uh, on the theme of efficient learning, um, how can you transition what you practice to your trading? I have a plan. I know exactly what I'm looking for. But as soon as I enter a trade, uh, my C game uh, emotions uh, are all, all over the wall, not seeing the bigger picture and trusting my back test. Psychology always seems to be the missing link. Uh, what should I do during trading to stay in check? I mean, I, hopefully this conversation is already kind of giving you, you know, a number of ideas. But I, I mean, I, I think, right, what you're suggesting is that you're kind of in the early stages of really kind of mapping and understanding you know, kind of what's happening to you, right? If you do not recognize the early signs of that emotional escalation, right? You don't have any chance of stopping it because your brain is compromised. That's a, a one of kind of the, the core tenets kind of features of the system. So yeah, I think to me, the, the number one thing you got to do is, is start mapping your pattern. And um, you can do that uh, going to the worksheets uh, on my website. Um, so there's a lot of worksheets here. Uh, this anger, discipline, fear, greed, uh, confidence, you know, and then there's a, several others that are all kind of corresponding to my system. So, um, you know, you want them all, download them all. Uh, there's a number of here that uh, that can certainly help. That's where that's where I would point you to start. All right, Richard, do you have any, any other thoughts here? Uh, nothing too much. Uh, just kind of like going back and studying stuff. Uh, what what I think is really important is to be intellectually honest and, and realize that, uh, you know, you're not going to trade it perfectly and, and you're not going to come up with these uh, amazing rules are going to work every time. There's a lot of uncertainty in the market. Uh, not everything is going to play out like it did in the past. So just be aware of that that fact that there's there's a little bit of uncertainty because it's the markets and you know news events can happen and there's so many different factors. So nothing is going to play out exactly like you studied, but you want to work and gain familiarity so you're ready for anything that could happen. Awesome. Okay. Uh, all right. This one came in advance. Uh, Corey's asking, uh, do you have any advice on how to mentally prepare yourself before the market open uh, a mental warm up of sorts? Uh, Richard, obviously we can get your thoughts here. My, I think for me, you know, I look at right a mental warm up, right. Means that you are reviewing some of the tools that you need to use. So that could mean like reviewing your anger, uh, you know, map of anger, your anger profile. Um, certainly any of the logic statements that you're going to use to counteract the problems that you're going to experience, but really it's like, just remind yourself of, uh, the things that you need to game plan against yourself. Now, if it's more of a mental warm up from a, like, I need to warm my body up as an athlete, need to warm my mind up to make decisions. You know, I don't know, Richard, you could talk about kind of what you do there. A lot of the things I suggest to traders is, right, it's either reviewing uh, other trades that you've, you've, you've had, maybe you're reviewing the prior day. Um, but yeah, it's kind of a, a decision making process that you want to kind of warm up. Yeah, well, before my soccer games, I like to stretch, make sure I don't pull a hip flexor. Uh, but yeah, on the, on the trade yeah, side. Old. <laughs> yeah. Um, on the training side of things, um, what I kind of do in the morning is I I make sure I look at all the charts of all the stocks that I'm, that I'm currently in. 
Uh, I'm kind of I've got a mental picture of where they're at, what could happen that day. I look at what the futures are doing, and I just kind of try to plan out if this, then that scenarios um, as much as possible. You're never going to be able to do it completely, but if you've got that situational awareness, uh, then when something actually happens, um, you're kind of ready and you've kind of thought things through beforehand. And this also goes with uh, with stocks that you're interested in entering that particular day. Uh, you want to plan as much as possible the entry point, the setup you're using, uh, position sizing, how you're going to manage risk. All these things can be decided beforehand um, and written down. I, I think that that's that's something that I found a lot of very helpful. Um, so it's just about execution at the end of the day. Um, and one more thing with that is I found. I'm able to execute a lot better when I'm focusing on four stocks or five stocks versus, you know, trying to enter a list of 10, 15 names all in one day. Uh, you know, it, it's all about kind of that that concentration and you've got a limited attention span uh, and you're just able to, you know, perform a little bit better when you're focusing your attention on a very select few of those A plus setups. Uh, so that's a little bit about what I do on a day to day basis. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And I think key word is right. You're not creating anything new, right? Anything new you know, would really be kind of adaptations, but not like, oh, let me start to create my profile today. Let me start to, you know, figure out what my game plan is for these setups. So it's like, it should it should be a warm up, not a creation. Uh, all right, this comes from Mike. Really love the full suite of mental game trading material. I filled out my A to C game analysis, mapped multiple motion patterns, using mental hand history, basically doing all the stuff that we see here. Um, and, uh, you know, corrected logic for each. The only thing I don't fully grasp is the strategic reminder. Could you elaborate on what this is, how to build one and offer a few examples? So ironically, right, this was, a, 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 I think, one of the bigger pain points within the master class, right? That right. This actually took a couple sessions for uh, traders to kind of really get, grab a handle of. So just for those that don't know, right, my kind of strategy for, you know, dealing with the mental game issue in the moment Four steps. Number one, you got to recognize that the pattern is started early. You got to disrupt the momentum of that pattern. You got to inject logic, right? Having the correction in hand so you can kind of, but then you do all those three steps and there should be some emotional stability, but it doesn't mean that you're automatically going to make better decisions, right? Trading poker doesn't matter. Now, the strategic reminder basically tries to conceptualize the key ideas that are going to help you to make a better trading decision. So for some, it means actually listing out your trading mistakes. And so it's very clearly like avoid that stuff. It could be listing out the criteria for which you're, you know, going to enter a trade in if you're a poker player, right? What are the, the decisions that you're, uh, the, the things that you're asking yourself, the information you need to gather in order to make a decision. Um, and, and, you know, you're actually writing it out and it's sort of forcing you. So the, the strategic reminder shouldn't, be creating anything new in that moment. It should just be reminding you of key elements that oftentimes go missing or that might be kind of mis uh, factored so that you can make a better decision. So I don't know, Richard, maybe you can kind of describe a couple points of what, you know, goes into you making decisions or that you think would be helpful reminders for yourself here. Yeah, I've kind of got descriptions of the, the setups I like to trade. Uh, but I, I, this is still something that I think going back through the course, I'm going to tailor and, and make even better. So, um, yeah, but it was definitely a pain point for for people taking the courses, getting this right um, and understanding what they really wanted to do. So, um, yeah. Yeah. OK, cool. All right. Uh, one more question that came in advance and then we'll uh, go to the, the live, live questions that you're all are posting. Uh, hey, Jared, I'm a recreational poker player turned recreational trader currently struggling in trading. Not much like I struggled when I first playing uh, when I. Uh, sorry, much like I struggled when first playing poker, playing too many hands, playing them deep uh, and not uh, folding enough. This is what uh, I do in my trading now, taking too many setups, not taking premium ones, letting losing go too far. What I don't remember was what clicked when I started folding uh, hands in poker. Can't seem to translate the poker skill I have to trading. Wonder if you have any advice for doing this. Um, is it just a lack of trading experience? I mean, so Rich obviously can't necessarily translate from poker to, to trading, but, you know, soccer, baseball, right? Yep. You know, you've kind of learned how to get to that point where, you know, things feel like they click in place. Um, my first thought here is that it actually isn't a point where things just kind of click, right? It, it, yes, that does happen for some people, but I've been working with, I had a client earlier today. Uh, we've been working together for eight months. Um, and it took eight months for something to click in place, right? So does that mean that it like has 
clicked in place in one singular moment? Like, was there like a time that he could look back and say, ah, now I've got it. And I think that's the flaw kind of embedded in what you're looking for. You're looking for uh, like a more magical moment when things will suddenly make sense. And I think it's trying to make that out to be too big, right? It's so hard for people who, you know, have a lot of skill, right, as you did in poker, to then, you know, kind of transition to a new environment. You kind of come in with these sort of subconscious expectations that you should be a little bit better than you are because uh, you've been good at something else. And I'm not saying that you're consciously thinking about this, but it it does create a little bit of um, uh, like kind of pressure internally to like get better faster and to kind of find that point that you had within poker. But it, I promise you, it, there wasn't that point. Most people, yes, of course it does happen. Most people don't have these like big moments where they're like, suddenly I've got it and then they're good forever. Most, it's just very much of a progression, step back, progression, step back. So yeah, I, I, I don't think it's just a lack of experience. I think you're kind of coming into it with um, a perspective that's forcing yourself to find this one moment that's going to transform things. I don't know. What do you, what, any thoughts here, Richard? Yeah, nothing too much more to add. Uh, I think 2021 over that year for me was kind of, I was working on on decreasing that over trading because that was definitely something I was going through. But yeah, I, I think it is a process and you know, you're, I'm still dealing with it a little bit, forcing not the best setup sometimes. Uh, so I think it is a progression. Um, you know, thinking back on soccer and, and baseball, um, yeah, it's just something you learn over time. Oh, for for soccer, I play center back and right back. Uh, so waiting, kind of the the metaphor I'd use is waiting for that opportune moment to tackle somebody. You don't want to just dive in and you're going to foul them, foul them, foul them. You want to wait for that heavy touch where you can jump in and, and get a good tackle in. Uh, so it's just something that you gain experience over time and you probably slowly improve over the course of the years. Um, yeah, so yeah, nothing, nothing too much to add uh, yeah, that you didn't already say. It's all good. All right, let's find the next question here. Uh, it comes from Michael. Um, um, if I think that my perfectionism is mainly due to a faulty view of the nature of perfection in the world, uh, how can I recalibrate to a more pragmatic way of thinking uh, mental models? So, yeah, I mean, listen, I am maybe a bit um, idealistic in the sense that I think inchworm can be an antidote to some of the flaws that exist in the way people view perfection in general. I think they view it, ten, it their, their view of perfection tends to be more static, right? That it's this one thing that you can achieve perfection and then you're done, right? Almost like it's like heaven on earth, right? You're sort of solved life. You solve trading. You've, and, and it's not, right? It's that the that, that perfection is defined by your current range, right? That, that the inchworm, the A to C game defines what perfection is for you today. But when you've hit it, it means that your capacity has grown and so now you're sort of chasing this ongoing uh, perfection that so it's like perfection is just a moving target. And the way you chase that is right. You got to suck less and then progress. And then, you know, that's kind of how it goes. So whether it's that or something else, and maybe if you have a thought on uh, what perfection exists in the world, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think if you're going to change it, yeah, you have to change the faulty view of how you see perfection in the world for sure to change your own perfectionism because it's defining what you ultimately are expecting or aspiring to. Yeah. I, I think uh, what perfection is in the world that that's a little bit too f philosophical for my mechanical <laughs> engineering brain. Uh, but, but I like a lot what you said about, you know, viewing it as just sucking less uh, and, you know, trending towards, you know, that ideal. I, I think that's a good way to think about it. Awesome. Um, have you seen people using machine machine learning uh, for trading? Uh, so in poker, this is happening quite regularly now. It's been, you know, a trend over the last, I want to say, Four years, I think, is when the first ones that I saw came out where there were these like, kind of GTO bots or right? the game theory optimal bots. You could play against them and they would kind of train you on how to play, uh, you know, kind of game theory optimal poker. That doesn't mean that's optimal poker. It just means that style of learning. Uh, but yeah, do you see anything like that in trading these days? Like kind of. Yeah, I was, I was actually just talking to uh, a guy I've met in Seattle who, who's who's got a bot that that he's been training and it seems to be working well. Uh yeah, I don't know how popular it is. I think it's probably pretty tough to to, to build it in a way that's really robust. Um, but I, th I think it's a really cool application for machine learning. I actually started grad school with a focus in machine learning. I, I paused that since then. But uh, I think it's a really interesting area. And it, I think it'll be cool to see what comes out of it. Um, you know, maybe maybe we'll just have to press some buttons and, and let the bot do what it wants and, and we make money. Uh, that, that, that's, that's kind of an ideal. But yeah, we'll see what happens. Stay out of the way. Cool. 
Uh, looks like there's uh, some fellow, fellow Terps here. Uh, ah, cool. Uh, all right. Uh, how can uh, one overcome perfectionism on learning? Great point, right? Perfectionism can be applied to anything um, or can affect anything. Um, I cannot study, start to study a concept or read a book before I set the most efficient way to do that. So I'll kind of go back to my blog. Um, you know, I've written a couple blogs recently, The Cost of Perfectionism and Perfectionists Who Procrastinate. My guess is you're probably not dealing with the, per, the procrastinator, uh, who per, the, per, the perfectionist who procrastinates. Um, but right, this uh, kind of cost of perfectionism blog, um, it really starts to kind of outline um, a, a strategy that I, I lay out in the mental game of trading. Uh, we do talk about it in the master class as well. Uh, and I've created a new worksheet uh, that you can use. But, but really what you're trying to do is reshape your perspective. If you're going to overcome perfectionism in learning, you have to overcome or solve perfectionism in general. This is not a specific issue uh, just to learning, right? It's a much deeper and more profound one. Uh, and so like really reshaping your perspective, not just on perfectionism, but really uh, kind of the nature of your own confidence uh, is, is really key in, in my mind. All right, let's get back here. Um, all right, we've got uh, 10 minutes left. Um, this is typically Richard when when I enter uh, the uh, lightning round. Um, let's see what uh, what kind of questions out there are, are here left. Uh, is there any advice about when to get out of a trade or let it run? Uh, I would imagine um, that just asking this question is is going to kind of light up some alarm bells in your mind, Richard. What do, what do you think here? Yeah, I I think uh, look back at your trades and see what. Look at what trades you did well in, what you did wrong in, and try to come up with a process that lets you know, based on a very rule-based method, when you should exit position. Uh, personally, what I do is I let kind of moving averages guide my uh, my exits and entries. Once I've, I'm at a profit and things are trending well, uh, two closes below the exponential 21 EMA is kind of my my point where I, where I cut the swing trade. Uh, but it's going to be very dependent on what your system is, your own personality, your risk tolerance. So it's a very general question. Um, but, you know, if, if you're asking that question, it means that you need to work on your system a little bit more and think about what you're trying to achieve in the market. Are you a mean reversion trader? Are you a, you know, range based trader where you're trying to buy the low of a range, sell at the high? Um, it's, it's just, it's a little bit too general of a question without knowing specifics um, to, to answer it adequately. But I would just say, you know, go back, study what you're trying to do and just come up with an objective rules-based approach to exiting a position. Maybe that's not the go-to that you're, you know, going to do for the next 20 years, but it's a start. Just iterate over that and try to get a little bit better, um, based on real results and real post analysis of, of past trades. Yeah, that's great. I, 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 th I think like the question even being asked in this format, right, this is primarily a psychologically oriented, uh, you know, show. So, you know, I think my guess is that the advice, it really, really should be coming from a more technical frame, right. which, is, which is what you're kind of uh, providing here and alluding to. And so to ask it here to me suggests, you know, that there is either a, a bit of a kind of lack of process in terms of how you're learning, right? And, and, you know, understanding the difference between some of the psychological, you know, pieces that are important to to focus on, and then the technical ones, right? There obviously is overlap, right? There's like a Venn diagram of sorts. But I think if you can't define your strategy uh, very cleanly, and then second to that, if you can't uh, like explain it to somebody uh, very very cleanly and quickly, to me, there's a weakness in your just your knowledge of your system, which in the heat of the moment, right, can create more emotional volatility, which then can lead to poor execution. Uh, and so, you know, that, that you know, kind of uh, systematizing, systematizing and, and hardening, right, go back to the unconscious competency standpoint, right, that, that, that's an important uh, part of what's going to make you more stable in those moments. Yeah, and I, I saw an answer in the chat that he's a futures breakout trader. Uh, so once you buy that breakout, uh, you have to define somehow the trend that you're trying to ride. Um, so once once that trend ends, based on that definition, that's kind of your signal to to exit the trade. So I would just kind of think about that a little bit uh, and uh, work work on really codifying uh, what you're trying to do and your system. Cool. 
All right. Uh, Jamie asks, um, I keep hesitating on good entries and exit trades too soon. I'm overwhelmed with questioning myself live trading. Uh, is the masterclass a good start beyond the book uh, or do I really need some coaching? I mean, I, I, I think kind of the, the feedback that we've gotten from the masterclass has been, you know, quite positive. I, I'm never one to say, you know, a hundred percent like that you, that the masterclass will be sufficient. Right. But I think from a, you know, an investment standpoint, it's obviously a cheaper way to go. Uh, it's also self-guided. Um, you know, I think, you know, if you put, put the effort into it, right, you're, you're going to be able to kind of find, right. The, the roots of, the fear or the confidence issues that are kind of embedded in this, uh, you know, this issue. And, and if you're able to do that enough, my guess is you're going to make some progress. Now, will it get you all the way TBD? Um, but I think at that point, maybe like one session with me might be enough, right? It's just kind of a, a capstone to like really personalize some very precise problems that you're having. But I think, again, what I try to do with the book and certainly try to do with the masterclass is provide so much, of a process and so much content that, you know, you ultimately wouldn't need me. Right. I think the more systematized th these things are, the, the more that I've, I've experienced so much with, with my, my private clients, like truthfully, I, like I get bored. Like I, I want to keep learning. It's, a it's really efficient for me to be standardizing and creating content that can help, you know, you all. And so like, I want to keep learning and the more I keep learning, right, the better I get as a coach and the better I get as, you know, somebody who can help you know you all. So yeah, I, I think the, the masterclass is it like provides a lot. Right? And, and so does it um, uh, like replace the book? Um, maybe I, I think, yeah, take, if you don't want to read the book, you can just go straight to masterclass, like the key pieces are there. I think where you might get stuck would be in like kind of filling out some of the mental hand histories, like kind of working through some of the tools, there is a lot of advice. I mean, look, the book's 300 pages long, there's, there's a lot of advice and perspective that's not in the masterclass. So I, I would still kind of look at those things as being a companion to each other. Um, but, you know, do you need coaching? Uh, you know, my hope is, is no, uh, truthfully. Uh, my hope is that I've done a good enough job. But if, if you need, you know, some additional perspective, then uh, obviously I'm happy to do that. Um, Michael's asking uh, how many videos are in the masterclass? Um, I'll, I'll just kind of show this um, page again here. Um, it's less about how many videos there are, right? So there's, I think we've got 13 less than 65 topics, five quizzes. So it's, I think, kind of more about like kind of total time. Um, I think in total, there's about 15 hours of content. Uh, the full recordings have all of it. Uh, yep. The modules have trimmed down just a little bit of the fat, right? You know, some of the intro and the, you know, things that would be more uh, characteristic of, um, you know, a, like a live webinar. We've kind of trimmed all that out to make the modules more efficient. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of content. I mean, I could look. You know, just kind of show you uh, here, right? What's what's in here? Um, there's a lot, and I'm I know I'm going quickly, so you're just gonna kind of have to go back and, um, uh, you know, just rewind the, the tape here. I want to be efficient with the end of this year. All right, um, maybe we got time for one more question, and then we'll wrap up. Um, what do we got here. Uh, Pongorn, if I'm saying your name correctly, uh, during market downturn or things not going as planned or expected, uh, my mind sometimes tries to rationalize the setup. Is there any advice to it or is it down to my discipline to stick to my trading rules? I mean, again, I think this is a perfect question for you and I to end on here because I think you could answer it very easily from both sides. From my perspective, right, I want to know what's going through your mind that's convincing you um, to uh, like go against it and, and or, or sorry, to rationalize it. Um, and I don't know that it's down to just discipline. Uh, I think in my experience, most of the time it's not right. That there is emotion there. And if there's emotion there, that's not a discipline problem. You know, it's anger, it's greed, it's FOMO, it's, you know, a confidence issue. It's overconfidence. Uh, you got to kind of define what that is if it's there. Um, if not, maybe it is down to a discipline rule. And you know, Richard, what do you, what do you, what are your thoughts here? My thoughts are, um, you know, when the market, enters a downturn or, or trends down, uh, things act differently than in a strong uptrend. So in a strong uptrend, and just, just to provide a simple definition, it's trending above a rising 50 day and 200 day moving average, uh, breakouts are going to work better. Stocks are going to trend because we're in an accumulation phase in the market. Um, that type of market is going to clean up your mistakes. Um, so it's going to reward you for maybe being a little bit sloppier with your risk management. But when that trend changes and instead of being above a rising 50 and 200 day 
we're now below a declining 50 and 200 day moving average. We get more volatile. Uh, breakouts are sold into. Uh, there's a lot more negative catalysts uh, because we're in a distribution phase in the market because institutions, you know, they've determined that their allocations in these stocks is too high because of the changing macro conditions. You know, whatever reason they have for trimming positions, they're doing it. Uh, and that shows up in the chart. So um, the same strategies that work in a nice trending market are not going to perform as well in a downtrend. Uh, William O'Neill, who, who's kind of the, the grandfather of the system that I use, Can Slim, um, he, he in his book very clearly says, do not buy breakouts in a bear market uh, because they're just not going to be as successful. So being aware of those changing conditions is important and you don't want to force things and try over and over again what worked in that previous period in this in this different environment. You got to either wait for that environment to improve again and we restart an uptrend, which will happen eventually, or you want to you know do things like shorten your time frame and adapt your style a little bit. Um, so it's better suited for that choppier, more volatile environment. So, um, yeah, I'm not quite sure if I answered that, but those are some ideas that I had uh, based on the the question here. Yeah, that's awesome. No, listen, I appreciate your answer here. Uh, appreciate you being on today. Um, just to give uh, some, uh, you know, kind of uh, advance notice here. Um, next office hours, uh, December 14th, we're going to kind of round out the year uh, on a topic that is uh, evaluating progress and hidden kind of key idea here is that many of you were doing it wrong. Um, yes, I do talk about evaluating progress in the masterclass. So some of those ideas are already there. Uh, but, you know, evaluating progress is a really important topic as we get to the end of the year, because if you're going to prepare yourself for 2023 and set new goals and get yourself ready, well, then, you know, you got to make sure that you are accurately assessing where you are, assessing the progress that you've made you know, and so this topic really kind of builds on, um, you know, the the idea that I kind of brought forth uh, last December, ending that year around how you're kind of recognizing your accomplishments. So uh, make sure you um, tune in next month. Um, as I said, uh, Black Friday sale uh, is upon us, right? The masterclass available for 200 bucks cheaper, maybe even more. I think right, kind of turn of the year uh, price is going to rise. Uh, and of course, if you want to pick up my books, uh, you can get them here, soft cover directly from me. I'm um, happy to sign them. Just make sure that when you go in to, to order it in the comment section, uh, you say, please sign it. And to whom, uh, if you're going to buy it for a friend or whomever else, I don't want to sign it to the wrong person. Uh, all right. Well, Richard, uh, thanks so much for uh, for joining me today. It was, uh, it was great to see you uh, in a different environment. Can I turn the tables a little bit? Get to ask you a few questions. And I, I know that your insights were, were really helpful to a lot of people. I can see the chat kind of uh, expressing that. And so... Yeah, man, appreciate your time and especially sticking for the full hour here. And uh, yeah, I hope you have a good, uh, good Thanksgiving and uh, the rest of the year. Yeah, you too. No, it's great to be on and uh, yeah, get me out of my comfort zone a little bit. Uh, but <laughs> great, great questions from everybody. And I always enjoy chatting with you because you provide such a different perspective, but one that's really beneficial for, for everybody. So yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. Awesome. All right. All right. Well, thanks, Richard. And thanks, everybody else. And uh, until next time, we'll see you later.